All right, gang. Hi again. Um, today's video is covering the uh, the latter half of the content for this week on Renaissance rhetorics, and we're actually looking at two pieces that I've never taught in this class before. Um, I have taught the Virginia Woolf piece before, but I've not done the Christine Bazan um, material, so it's a bit of a new. Uh, direction here, trying out. The um, the idea with this pairing of readings is to be thinking about um, the Renaissance era. That's a you know big time period covering a broad geographic area in Europe, starting around the 15th century. Um, and we're coming at this much in the same way. I, hopefully you remember the, the reading by Hannah Arendt when we were very first starting out uh, this semester looking at ancient Greek life, right? Remember I was talking about rhetoric as a social practice, something that people do um, that kind of comes out of the ways that we're living together. And we talked about the rise of democracy and the rise of rhetoric kind of coming along with that as this kind of necessary new form of social practice. And then the theories were kind of coming out of that new practice, right? So we have all of these theories talking about sort of the principles of the practice. Um, but for me, at least, the, the sort of the social structures and the history itself and how people are living together and what they're doing is the primary kind of concern in terms of like how rhetoric matters and what it is and what it does. So, you know, we've now shifted into the sort of the onset of what we now think of as like the modern period, modern life, um, the Renaissance period. And so as we did with Iran, we're looking at this question of like the social landscape. Um, in my last video, I talked about, and this is an important theme, I wanna hit it again. Starting in the 15th, 16th centuries, and then going right through to the 20th century, rhetoric is um, no longer an important part of um, how it is that citizens engage one another and try to kind of mediate knowledge and, and ideas and influence and so on. Rhetoric, as Herrick notes, is important in the Renaissance period, but it has a different kind of social function. And so we can think about rhetoric more in line with poetry and with like courtly manners um, and how one comports oneself, right? So rhetoric becomes more about writing, composition, style. We talked about that, style and delivery, but especially style and thinking about style in terms of how one conducts oneself, how one uses language, how one engages others in a mannered fashion, right? I also talked about the privatization of knowledge and rhetoric, and this is part of that as well. It's this idea that rhetoric is not used so much in terms of people coming together out in social space, specialized forums or whatever, to try to, you know, persuade and influence one another. It's more private spaces. It's salons. It's um, this life of courts, that we get into with Paisan, um, right? So it's smaller audiences, smaller groups. And so rhetoric becomes more about um, individual expression, style, and so on. And we see that, certainly we see that in the Paisan piece. And um, we also get an interesting look at that through Wolf. So I'm actually going to talk about the Virginia Wolf piece first and then move into Paisan. So I wonder if anyone out there has actually read Virginia Woolf before. It's a pretty well-known essay. At least when I was an undergrad, it was you know talked about a fair bit still. A um, couple things to note off off the bat here. So Virginia Woolf is um, a more late modern figure. So her um, the years that she was active, she was born in 1882 and she died by suicide in 1941. So she was almost 60 years old, right as the Second World War was kicking in. She um, committed suicide. So, and and this essay, Room of One's Own, was published in 1928. So that's an interesting sort of time period for us. But for us, that's already almost a century ago. But it's also quite a distance removed from the historical period that we're looking at here. So much like Hannah Arendt, 
who also was writing in the middle part of the 20th century, looking back on the ancient context. Here we have, um, a, she was a novelist, she was a fiction writer, uh, Virginia Woolf wrote you know, great fiction, but also essays, like critical essays, feminist-driven essays. And she was doing this in the early to mid part of the 20th century, looking back on, at least in this piece, looking back on, you know, the early modern period, the, the 15th, 16th century, which was when Shakespeare was active, 16th century. All right, so the reason I wanted to look at this piece is I, there's actually few essays that bounce around in my brain or have bounced around in my brain as much and as long as this particular essay has. Like I read this, um, pretty sure it was an undergraduate literary theory seminar I took as an undergraduate as I was an English major and I took this brilliant class on literary theory. And I think we came across her stuff there. The reason I love this essay so much, my own work over the years has gone in the direction of materiality and, and thinking about conditions, physicality, right? And so it's how it is our, like our physical built world and our environment and so on kind of shapes our abilities and behaviors and possibilities and even our kind of thought processes and so on. So what Virginia Woolf is up to is, you know, this is a feminist critical essay thinking about why it is that women have not produced more and more brilliant works of literature. And so she's going at this by asking this question of like, if I go to the history shelf and I just start pulling down history books, I'm going to find all kinds of guys and men in there. And, you know, doing all their militaristic things and their political things and inventing things and so on and so on. But she's like, where are the women in the history books? What were they doing? Why aren't they mentioned or featured? Why weren't women a, aren't, why aren't women a part of the historical record more so, right? And her particular interest is in literature and in, in the works of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, obviously known as, as one of the greatest, most brilliant um, fiction writers of all time in the English language. And um, she's using his genius as a way to think about the question of conditions, right? And this fascinating, fascinating little kind of thought experiment about Shakespeare's sister. Um, there's even a band back, I think it was in the 80s, there was a band kicking around called Shakespeare's Sister, had a couple of popular tunes. Um, and I'm wondering if that's a reference to um, the Virginia Woolf essay. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the little details of this, but I absolutely love this essay and this part of this essay where she's kind of trying to imagine the social conditions. This is kind of what we're interested in here, right? So again, with Arendt, the social conditions in ancient Athens or ancient Greece was such that you know, we had the home and then we had this sort of the public space very separate from the home. And it was the men, the head of the house, who were able to kind of step away from the domestic space, the private space, to enter into this public realm of engagement. And this is the, the realm of excellence and action and speech and greatness and freedom and so on, right? Now in the in the early modern period, in the Renaissance period, we have a different kind of social situation. Arendt actually talks about this, uh, if we were to continue in that chapter, she talks about this thing called the rise of the social. So in the modern period, we lose this old distinction, this ancient distinction between the home and the public realm. And that kicks in with what we said about the privatization of knowledge, right? The public realm that we talked about in the, in the Greek and Roman context doesn't really exist in this, in that way anymore, right? And so rhetoric takes on this kind of weird new function of being more private, more about how one conducts oneself, how one engages with others in a kind of stylized way, you, the use of language and the manners of, of language use and so on. All right, so she's looking at the kind of the social conditions and the social structures and the social spaces of that, that period that we're looking at here. And she's doing it imaginatively, right? This is, um, it's a nonfiction essay. This is Virginia Woolf writing kind of her thoughts about the status of women in the early modern period. Um, but it's not, this isn't like historical, nonfiction, data-driven. It is that, but it's also imaginative. In fact, she even says um, in the kind of key moment on page 2267 here, um, 
that bottom paragraph, it says, uh, I could not help thinking as I looked at the works of Shakespeare on the shelf that the bishop was right at least in this. It would have been impossible completely and entirely for any woman to have written the plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. Let me imagine, since facts are so hard to come by, and then on she goes, right? Now, this is where her novelistic qualities and strengths really kick in. And one of the things I love about this piece is because she's thinking about historical social structures, right? How it is that, you know, daily life was lived in the home and in society. and, and But she's doing that in this really beautifully sort of detailed, rendered, this way of, of like sort of thinking about the past novelistically, right? As though she were kind of recreating scenes in a fictional way. But it's not fiction. It's this kind of historical imagination that she's doing. Um, but she's getting it really, really detailed um, look at what life would likely have been like for a young girl had she, you know, been the sister of Shakespeare himself, William Shakespeare. And what if she was born with this burning desire to write fiction, poetry, theater, plays, whatever? And what if she had his abilities, his genius, right? Her point is like, it wouldn't matter. It's not about his genius versus her lack of genius. She even has this great line at some point here. I don't know if I'm going to find it. Um, something about how the genius, you can't find works of genius amongst the, like, the laboring classes and, the, and so on. The point being, like, in order to be able to create and compose one's contributions, literary contributions, you need... 500 a year and a room of one's own. That's sort of the final kind of big payoff, right? That's She's thinking about the material conditions, right? Shakespeare himself, William Shakespeare, Bill, would have been able to kind of take some time off. He could go on walks. He could take a little vacation. He could spend time in the city with his fellow, you know, his, his pals, drinking, imagining, you know, new stories, right? He would have had the time. He would have had that sort of privileged, structured time that young girls would not have gotten, right? So the pages on 2267, especially 2268, is where she's going through this kind of historical reimagining of the life of Shakespeare's sister. Um, and I just love it because she talks about, you know, education the fact that Shakespeare would have, William would have gotten education. And I love the fact that she noticed, um, it says here, let us say Shakespeare himself went very probably, his mother was an heiress, to the grammar school where he may have learned Latin. Latin was still considered like the ultimate kind of educated language. Ovid, Virgil, Horace, the greats, and the elements of grammar and logic. I found that very interesting. Um, that actually hits perfectly on what we talked about in the last video, this sort of demise of rhetoric, thanks to Ramus, Peter Ramus, who came along and said, you know, rhetoric is basically just like poetry and invention, discovery, knowledge, ideas, that belongs over to, to philosophy and logic. So here we've got grammar, sort of the arts of composition and expression and syntax and so on. And then over there you've got logic, but there's no rhetoric. Notice this, right? So you know, several hundred years ago, you would you would probably have heard her write something like grammar, rhetoric, and logic. But here she's noting that just grammar and logic are um, what a young schoolboy would have learned. So rhetoric is um, again different. It's it's more about style, poetic expression, and so on. But that's not the main point. The main point is that you know she's playing out this idea that. William Shakespeare would have had the time, would have had the privileged time. This idea of privilege is pretty key throughout all this. You know, he would have had the ability to um, to step away from kind of the, the daily, it's sort of like a version of what Arendt was saying, like being able to step away from the, the necessities of domestic life and private life. William Shakespeare would have been able to... Um, to enjoy some separation from that. Whereas uh, Judith, that's the name she comes up with for his sister, she would have been, you know, compelled to like just focus on house chores. And if she she expressed to her father that she wanted to write. So 
everyone would have discouraged her. She, if she was trying to write poems, she'd have to do it up in an attic somewhere and maybe she would hide them or burn them or something like this. I love all these like little novelistic details that she gives and trying to capture like actual existence at this time, right? You know, she might not have wanted to get married, but everyone kind of compelled her to get married. And maybe she even ran away. She ran to London so that she could be, you know, amongst the, the scene of theater and playwrights and actors. But back then, if I don't know if anyone remembers um, Shakespeare in Love. Uh, very famous movie from back in the, like, 90s, I think, um, with Gwyneth Paltrow and, and um, Ray Fiennes. No, Joseph Fiennes, his brother. Um, it, I think it won a bunch of awards and everyone loved it. And, and Gwyneth Paltrow plays, um, a woman, a woman at the time who was trying to get into theater. I can't remember. It's been a while, but like just, just being a woman was not allowed. You couldn't be an actor if you were a woman, right? Female parts were played by men, young men oftentimes. And so even trying to be an actress would have been hard. Never mind a writer or a producer or director or whatever. And so she ends up killing herself in this imagined scenario, which is a constant theme of many um, works of fiction of women in this time, right? It's like they often end up committing suicide because, you know, if you had aspirations, if you had dreams, if you had ambitions, everything sort of in your structured world was against that. So I wrote in the column here a few times, like, structural impediments on page 2269, right sort of dead center there. Oh, sorry, I almost sneezed. It says, uh, to have lived a free life in London in the 16th century would have meant for a woman who was a poet and playwright a nervous stress and dilemma, which might well have killed her. Had she survived, whatever she had written would have been twisted and deformed, issuing from a strained and morbid imagination. So another one of the things I love about this essay is she's thinking about the relationship between subjectivity and structure, right? Um, which is just, a, I think, a brilliant way to think about how it is that things take shape in important ways. Subjectivity being sort of our minds are interiorized, right? So she's looking at Judith's subjectivity or this, you know, this creature, this imagined fictional creature from the past, um, what it would have been like, not just in terms of daily life, but like what one's going through internally, the struggle and the way that struggle comes, might've come out in these works. Like think about the works of Emily Bronte or, um, um, you know, Jane Austen, like the, the tortured, troubled, Emily Bronte in particular, my goodness, uh, Wuthering Heights is, is pretty, pretty grim stuff, pretty tortured stuff. But again, it's, it's like, think about your, con your place in the world of social structures and conditions. And if you had any ambition, if you were a young girl and you wanted to write, if you wanted to travel, everything was against you, right? And so Virginia Woolf is really drawing attention to those kind of structural impediments and obstacles, um, thinking about that early modern period, right? Now, that's an interesting setup for Paisan, which we'll get to in just a second here. But, you know, it gets to this question of, of what a society privileges and, um, and how it structures itself in, in terms of those privileges, right? So um, she says toward the end, something about the indifference, right? So the bottom of 2270, she says, but for women, I thought, looking at the empty shelves, these difficulties were infinitely more formidable. In the first place, to have a room of her own, let alone a quiet room or a soundproof room, was out of the question, unless her parents were exceptionally rich or very noble, even up to the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and then it says, such material difficulties were formidable, but much worse were the immaterial. So she's been focusing on the material conditions, right? Like, you know, how much money one had, how much room, physical space, how much time they had. These are all kind of physical, material realities. But what about the immaterial? And then she says, the indifference of the world, which Cates and Flaubert and other men of genius have found so hard to bear, was in her case, not indifference, but hostility, right? So again, thinking about the kind of priorities of the dominant priorities of society at any given time are going to find expression in its social structures. And, you know, her account of William Shakespeare, I wrote in the, in the margin there, social grease. Like if you were a guy and you were a talented guy, there was grease all around you, right? Like the guys at the theater would know you, they'd welcome you in. If you were a woman, not only not grease, but like Velcro holding you down to the ground kind of idea. Um, so I think this is an absolutely brilliant essay in terms of thinking about 
past conditions that give rise to one's ability um, to be successful and accomplished or not, right? And and what we see here is a world of, well, as we know, this is a world of like manly science, philosophy, right? It's still a world where guys are sort of, sorry, screen froze. Um, what am I at here? 20 minutes. So yeah, still a world where guys are, um, you know, in charge of all the major social structures and the laws and dominant industries and women, we were still relegated to the private sphere. And what you see here is this longing to get out of that and to do more. And why Why couldn't we? Why isn't there more great works of literature from women? She provides a brilliant accounting of this. And so at the end, um, this great, great moment, this great line, the kind of the big payoff line, this is 2272, it says, just above the middle of that last paragraph, it says, For my belief is that if we live another century or so, I'm talking of the common life, which is the real life, and not of the little separate lives which we uh, live as individuals, and have 500 a year each of us, and rooms of our own, if we have the habit of freedom and the courage to write exactly what we think, if we escape a little from the common city room and see human beings not always in the relation to each other, but in relation to reality, in the sky, on and on and on, if, 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 if. Now, just before this, she has admonished her audience of, of women. You know, again, this is 1928. It's actually 1929 on this page here. She's admonishing women. She's saying, look, you can go to college. You can vote. Right? There are structures that are now available to us that were not available to Judith Shakespeare. And so she's kind of like encouraging and prodding her audience to kind of like go. These are available structures to you. Now you got to orient your own thinking. Now you got to sort of that subjective piece now needs to kind of uh, match up to this, the, the opening of these social structures. So I love that kind of that deeper story about the relationship between subjectivity, how one thinks about one's place in the world, and the structures that are available to that, to that individual. So I'll stop there with 20 minutes. Um, Seriously, I do encourage you to, I, you're supposed to read everything in this class, but like this particular essay, um, I just think it's so brilliant. I think it's such a great kind of way to get at these questions and doing it in a way that's kind of novelistic and creative, but also dealing with historical realities and, and thinking through those problems and, and doing it in a way that's trying to actually move the audience. So there's a rhetorical effort in here. She's not talking about rhetoric directly. She's talking about the possibilities of being a rhetorical citizen in the early modern period and how difficult it was for women. So with that, we'll turn to an example, a sort of contrary um, perspective somewhat in terms of what uh, Wolf's talking about here. So Christine de Pazan uh, was in fact born in um, Italy, in Venice. And the dates there are 1364 to 1420. So she's a little bit before the period that Wolf is talking about. And um, in my other book that I use a lot, this one here, um, which is where the excerpt for Paisan came from, actually groups her in the medieval, medieval period, right? So the Renaissance period comes next. She's not in there. So in this book, she's medieval. And in Herrick, she's Renaissance, and Herrick talks about her a little bit on page uh, 169, 170, all right? Um, so she's just at the onset of the Renaissance period, and Herrick talks about that a little bit. Um, she's noteworthy as being the first, potentially the first woman of letters in the West, right? The first, like, accomplished female writer and not just for having, like, so she's sort of doing something like what Wolf was saying was not possible. And so she's exceptional. She's an exception to the norm, if we are to believe Wolf, that, you know, to be a woman in this time period was to be basically just a subject of the private realm. But so she is, Paisan is someone who managed to kind of rise above that. And what's interesting, though, is that she was able to do that with privilege. Like, she she came from a wealthy, noble family. Her father was very educated and successful and, you know, had high level connections. And so she did well in her early life. She lost all of her important family members early in life. She was only 25. So she did still have to kind of make her way. But by then she had been well set up to, to succeed. So um, in terms of those social structures, she was a, she was 
a beneficent of you know her father's connections and then her husband's connections as well. So privilege is still important here, right? So the, one's ability to have access to um, the kinds of education and the kinds of connections that would allow one to write and to be a successful writer, I think Wolf's analysis still applies here, right? This is not like, she's not refuting Wolf. Um, she's just sort of showing an exceptional case that kind of proves the rule, I think. Um, as I was going through this, these short excerpts from these two things that she wrote, uh, let's see, where are we here? We have the um, just a page from the book of the City of Ladies, and then a few pages from the Treasure of the City of Ladies. What's interesting, I mean, there's not too too much that's complicated going on here, but it's a fascinating um, sampling of you know what a a young female writer would would write um, in the uh, what was the date on this one. Sorry. Um, I think it was like early 15th century, like 1407 or something like that. Yeah, so the my kind of read of these of these pages here is that they are in, in many ways very progressive for what a young woman would have been able to write, but also fairly conservative at the same time, right? And so Basically, what she's doing here is she is um, she's challenging, and and uh, I think Herrick says this, and Bazell and Herzberg say this as well, is that she was the first kind of feminist. Um, she you know she had sort of a feminist sensibility in, in how she was going after a lot of received attitudes about women and what they were capable of, and sort of these old ideas about innate inferiority and biologically inferior, and only just you know. You stay at home and take care of kids and all that kind of stuff and let us guys go off and, you know, do the important things. And she was challenging that kind of misogynistic way of thinking about what a women uh, are capable of, right? She's explicitly going after that. But she's also, especially in that first one, that first, uh, the book of the City of Ladies. Um, no, not that one. Sorry. Uh, the Treasure of the City of Ladies. Um, these virtues that she's talking about is quite interesting because she's basically suggesting that women have power as um, the left column on 546, that, that second paragraph begins. And so this lady will be, by pure, mild, and holy charity, an advocate and mediator. So she's talking about women who are in fairly privileged positions being able to influence their husbands, their their fathers, other powerful men of the court. Um, so they can they can perform this function of kind of speaking on behalf of others who have less power, right? And so they have influence and she's advocating for women to use influence in sort of political affairs and civic affairs. But but there's a there's a there's a I don't know there's a sense of kind of always pulling back, not going too far with the the progressiveness, right? And so She's progressive in the sense that she's advocating for women's kind of civic voice and civic power and influence. But at the same time, she defaults to a lot of this old ideas about women sort of being delicate and, you know, nurturing and morally sort of superior and, and the calming, you know, um, nurturing force that we all kind of know about. And so she's playing both sides of that question, right? So women have the ability to be eloquent and powerful in their speech and they can admonish and they can advocate, but they also need to kind of know their place, right? And so she's not being radical, but she was also kind of being radical for the times, right? So when we look back on this, we might say, oh, wow, she's really like, you know, she's saying a lot of things that today we would think are pretty conservative still, but I think, you know, this being a very first, um, you know, example of a woman's voice in print in a kind of public way. It's quite interesting to see how she's walking that line, right? So let's see here. Um, yeah. And, you know, especially toward the end there on um, when she's talking to, um, at first she's talking to print this sort of the noble princess, but then she starts talking to other lower women of the court 
And it gets really weird. Like if you're if you're a princess and you have power, then you can wield that power in these ways. But if you are a lower member of the court, then you must realize that you are dependent on these higher, you know, wealthier, more powerful people, and you should just shut up. So it's it's a bit of a contradiction. I noted, in the sense that early on she's talking about sort of the moral clarity of of being a woman and knowing kind of like what's best and you know how to wield that. But then later on, she's noting, but if you are more subservient, then you should basically just hold your tongue. And there's a moment where she says, even if, number seven there on 549, how women of the court ought to be very careful not to speak evil of their mistress, right? So if, even if you know your mistress is like wrong and doing something terrible and evil, hey, and it's actually confirming Wolf's ideas, like materially speaking, in terms of your conditions, you are beholden to this person. So you got to just shut up. You got to hold your tongue. So there's an interesting sort of theory of power in here as well, hierarchy and where one belongs and what kind of rhetorical abilities are available to you based on where you are in the courtly order, right? Um, so last thing I would note here, uh, can't seem to get these under 30 minutes, but it's fine. We're almost done. So last thing I would say is to echo something that I think Herrick or Bazell and Hertzberg say, which is, um, neither Wolf nor uh, Paisan are theorists of rhetoric. And Paisan in particular is of interest here. She's the one who's in our, our history book. Um, she didn't theorize rhetoric. She talks about it a little bit. But what's mostly interesting in here is how she uses rhetoric, right, in terms of her language, in terms of her ability to compose and be a member of a kind of social order where she is leaning in through her writing and through the kind of style of thought. So this is pretty typical now of how it is that rhetoric is taking shape and what it's becoming, which is less about public engagement, right? Thinking about enthymemes and docs and all that kind of stuff. And it's more about how one expresses oneself as a member of a social order, right? So again, it's, it's more about your kind of private etiquette, your, your use of language and use of style and ability to reason and all that kind of stuff. So rhetoric has a much more subdued role here, but we can see that how one wields language and ideas and, and composition and publication can count as sort of rhetorical action, right? All right, so that's pretty good, I think. I think these are two fascinating essays, um, the Wolf one in particular, but again, that's a more modern look at a historical situation. The Paisan is, piece is a sampling of that older uh, situation and how a young lady was able to, to um, become an exception to the, to the kind of thing that Wolf was talking about. So I hope you enjoy that. It's an interesting uh, way of looking back on the past. Um, and so we will continue next week moving forward with 17th and 18th century rhetoric and see there how it is that this separation of logic and style continues to play itself out. Um, midterm grades are coming soon. I actually have a fair bit of work right now, um, despite our, you know, quarantine. So I'm getting there. It's on the list. I'm going to get to as soon as I can. Hope all's well. Reach out if you need to and see you soon.